Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's workshop, Systematic Screening for Tuberculosis Disease, Adapting and Implementing Global Recommendation to Meet Local Context. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Your microphone has been muted to avoid background noise, and we encourage you to turn your webcam on throughout the session. Can we please ask you to change your display name to your name and country? Click on participants on the bottom menu bar over the mouse, over the mouse over your name, click on more, click on rename, enter your name and country on the screen name field and click the OK button. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions and comments to today's presenters by typing your question into the chat. You can send questions via the chat at any time during the session. The moderators will collect them and address them after the speaker's presentation in the allocated Q&A section. You will have the opportunity to intervene in today's session by submitting a request to do so via the chat or by raising your hand. The moderators will record your request and inform you when you can intervene. They will have the opportunity to provide feedback in the end of the session evaluation survey, which will appear directly in your browser once the meeting closes. And it's important to complete the survey right after the workshop, as the access link will only be available for a short period of time right after the workshop. You will receive a certificate based on your attendance and the completion of the evaluation survey. Please note that this session is being recorded and the recording will be available to the public a few days after the session. Finally, it is my pleasure to inform you that today's chairs are Professor Jeremiah Chakaya and Dr. Grania Gregden. Over to you, Professor Ma. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome everybody to this uh, uh, workshop on um, to help us to understand WHO guidance on TB screening, uh, including recommendations on who should be screened and on what tools we should be using. I think we, we have a very exciting um, set of speakers for today and a very ex exciting program. And I'm, I'm very pleased to know that we've had an enormous response to this workshop and uh, people I can see are still joining, but we're expecting a very large number of participants to attend, which I think attests to the great interest that there is in the, um, the need for TB screening or active case finding for uh, tuberculosis. Today we have, as um, as you've just been told, we have Professor Jeremiah Chakaya from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, um, former president of the union, uh, former head of the National TB program in Kenya, and a very experienced uh, TB and respiratory physician from Kenya uh, as one of our chairs. And our other chair, we're also very pleased to have Dr. Grania Brigden, who's currently now with the a senior advisor on tuberculosis with the Global Fund, but previously will, will be well known to many of you for through her role as the head of TB department at, at the union. And she has a very long history of uh, engagement in TB control, uh, in clinical trials, and in and in working with communities on TB. And we have a number of very good speakers for you uh, today, and I'll just very briefly uh, introduce them at the beginning of the session, so that we won't interrupt the flow <laughs> during the session. Um, the speakers um, include. Uh, Dr. Cecily Miller, who's an epidemiologist and currently a technical officer in the Department of TB Prevention, Diagnosis, Treatment, Care and Innovation Unit within WHO's Global TB Program based in Geneva. She's done, uh, she's coordinated, in fact, the 
uh, WHO's work on TB screening. Um, and she has a strong focus on TB and digital innovations uh, screening for TB and digital innovations in TB care. She formerly worked in at the University of California in San Francisco in their Center for TB. Um, another speaker is Dr. Nguyen Tuang, also an epidemiologist and a social scientist. Um, she's had more than 20 years of experience working in TB and in HIV and in public health. Um, she's an honorary senior lecturer at the University of Sydney, and she's the country director for the Wilcock Institute of Medical Research in Vietnam, where she's led a number of very uh, significant uh, research projects, including on active case finding and latent TB infection. Um, the next speaker is Dr. Saskia Den Boon, uh, also a technical officer in the department in the same department, TB Prevention, Diagnosis, Treatment, Care and Innovation at the Global TB Program in Geneva, uh, in WHO. She also has a, a focus on TB screening and prevention, um, and as well, as well as on research and innovation. And she previously worked as a consultant for WHO Department of Immunizations, Vaccines and Biologicals. Um, the next speaker is Dr. Vanessa Veronese. She's uh, an Australian public health uh, uh, professional with a background particularly in infectious diseases, working in HIV, TB and COVID. She has a PhD in epidemiology and a master's of international public health. And she's been working at the WHO um, um, in, in Geneva uh, since September 2019. And the final speaker is Dr. Jacob Cres Creswell, who's from the Head of Innovations and Grants at the Stop TB Partnership. Uh, in this capacity, he's coordinated from now for many years the, the TB REACH program, which many of you will be very familiar with. And in that capacity, it has made... Um, as, and in that capacity has supported, has supported uh, much of the work on uh, innovation and uh, programmatic innovation in tuberculosis case detection and improving treatment outcomes. So we're very pleased to have Jacob uh, to join us in this session. So they're the speakers uh, and um, um, thank you to all of them for joining us. The ne my next task is to get us started with this uh, uh, innovation known as Slido. Many of you will have seen something like this before. And what I need to do is to share my screen with you. Um, if you just bear with me for a moment. Um, sorry. Have I got the right screen up? Yep. Yep. And this is what you need to see. So we're going to ask you to, oh, we're going to ask you to go, no, not to that one, to the previous one. Sorry. This. Oh, okay. We're going to ask you to uh, use, uh, you, you have a number of ways you can open this Slido app, either on your computer or on your mobile device. You can do it by clicking on that, that hyperlink, or you can do it by opening slido.com and entering the, the words there, hashtag TV screening or you can do it by scanning that QR code. You have three choices about how you can enter Slido. And I'd like to ask you all now to do that. I've just put also the link in the chat for people if they want to access it like that. You can also click on that link, yes. That's probably the easiest. <laughs> you can cl click on that link and you will like this. 
and you should open um, your browser in Slido and you will be asked a question. The first question, once it opens. Um, Guy, shall I uh, share my screen? Then we can see, so I see a lot of people answering the question already. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, good. They're well ahead of me. I'll stop sharing and I'll let you share. Ah, South Africa is winning, which is interesting. India and the United States are a close second. Is this like the Olympics gold medal table or something like that? I don't know. Oops. In my case, it keeps coming off. So Saskia, should we ask people to go to the next question now? Uh, be... Sure. Yeah, I also okay. saw some people putting uh, in the chats countries uh, where they're coming from, but it's good. It's great to see people are from all over the world joining. I'll put the next uh, the next question. I hope. Can people, I hope people can so access this now too. You, you should be able to access it from your Slido if you've opened it. You just move to the next question. And then we'll see the results coming up on, on um, Saskia's I might have to open it actually, yeah. Oh, let's go back to the. Um, Great. I'm briefly going to, sorry, I'm just going. I can remember when you answered these questions by asking people to put up their hand. <laughs> you know, room. <laughs> so it's not, uh, this is somewhat more interesting. And somebody had to count. Okay, you want to go to the next question? Yeah. We've got the gist, there's a lot of people here from NGOs. Might have to again activate that.
So a pretty good spread of people, researchers, clin healthcare workers, clinicians, managers, a few policy makers, but a, big, a good spread of um, people, which is what we were hoping. Well, clinicians are making a comeback here. Okay, let's go on to the next one before they catch up. <laughs> uh, okay, Claire. Oh, back to it, Paul. The blokes and the Sheilas. The Sheilas and the blokes. All right, I think people are getting the hang of it. <laughs> and uh, we again got a pretty good split there. I think we're we up to the last question now. Yes, I, I think this was the last question. Uh, yeah, uh, this was the last, the last question. That's the last question. Um, okay. People, yeah. So everyone's got the hang of it. We've got a, we've got a bit of an idea about the sorts of uh, people that we have here from a huge range of countries, uh, a lot of settings, um, a lot of different uh, job categories, and both men and women. So um, thank you very much for participating in that. There'll be some more meaningful questions for you <laughs> later on. And now I'm going to hand to one of the co Brownie to, um, to um, So Grania, over to you. Hello um, and welcome everyone. Um, and good evening and good morning to those because I see we have a really great geographical spread. So thank you to those staying up late and thank you for those joining us early. Um, so uh, you've had a good opportunity to uh, start to get comfortable with the Slido um, app. So at the end of the workshop, we would like to have a discussion with, with everyone here to, today to really talk about the TB screening implementation challenges. And this is a real opportunity where we would like to hear from you. So the next set of the workshop is where you know, you're going to hear from some of our experts, but the end after the breakout group where first of all, we'll get a chance to be practical, but also then have a discussion where we get to hear from you about what your challenges have been in conducting active case finding and screening, your experiences of implementing or planning or implementing and planning active case finding and screening and initiatives, and really as a group discuss some of the potential solutions to challenges challenges experienced and the solutions that have been implemented by our audience today. So to prepare for this, this discussion, we would really like to collect your implementation challenges and experiences through the Slido app. And perhaps Saskia could share her screen on the, so in this, we've, you've been on the poll section of the Slido. So there's another uh, uh, tab under the Q&A where you can type in your experiences with implementing TB screening programs um, and the challenges that you have faced and the ways that you have potentially overcome this. This will be open throughout the, the workshop. So as questions or as you, 
have a chance to reflect on your experiences or your challenges, please feel free to type this in at any stage through the workshop. You, you can also keep an eye on it and upvote any comments or questions that are already on the Slido app. For example, if you've had similar experiences or similar challenges and you, you can, if you like, want to reply to some of these questions so we can get the conversation going ahead of the bigger group that uh, conversation at the end of two days workshop. So hopefully you've already accessed Slido for the polling questions, but I do know that some people have been joining as we've been finding out about our audience. So as a reminder, you can access Slido in three ways, uh, through the link, which we will put in the chat, or by going to the slido.com and entering the event code hashtag TB screening, or through the QR code that was on the slide earlier. Um, if you are unable to open Slido, don't worry, we would really, you're, you can absolutely still be part of the conversation. So please share your challenges and experiences in the chat section of the Zoom platform. And at the end, we will integrate these two uh, modes for us to communicate and share our experiences as we have the bigger group conversation. So um, looking forward to hearing uh, your challenges, your solutions and your experiences. Um, and we can also have an opportunity at the breakout session after the breakout session to talk about it uh, within the bigger group. So uh, thank you very much, everybody. And I think now um, we'll be introducing our first speaker, Cecily. Cecily, so over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kanya and Guy and everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be speaking today. I will go ahead and share my slides. Um, as Guy mentioned, I uh, worked on the update to the TB screening um, uh, WHO recommendations and principles um, This uh, that happened largely last year and came out uh, earlier this year. So um, I am excited to uh, share them with you sure. all now. Can everybody see my slides, my screen okay? Yes. Okay. And I have no conflict of interest to report. So I'll start by briefly just defining what we mean by systematic screening for TB disease. We define it as the systematic identification of people at risk for TB disease in a predetermined target group by assessing symptoms and using tests, examinations, or other procedures that can be applied rapidly. So the key features of this are that it, it's done systematically to an entire selected population or group. It's not done by, by sort of clinical judgment and that differentiates it from standard clinical care. It should be done with a highly sensitive screening tool to distinguish people that have a higher probability of, of TB, but that screening tool is not meant to be diagnostic so that a positive screening test needs to be followed by a thorough and, uh, thorough and proper diagnostic evaluation using a test with high accuracy to confirm a diagnosis or rule it out. And screening needs to follow established ethical principles that are, again, a bit different from standard clinical care. And I'll come back to that at the end. Um, so TB screening plays a few roles in global TB care. First off, we know that it can help reach those populations that are the most vulnerable and that often have the least access to care. So on the right here, we have just a brief uh, illustration of the patient initiated pathway on the top, which we know can be very fraught and full of barriers. And on the bottom as a representation of the screening pathway, which again is a, is a provider initiated process that, that hopes to overcome or streamline many of, of those barriers. TB screening is also an essential first step prior to initiating TB preventive treatment in order to rule out TB disease. And this is also a life-saving intervention, as we know, in high-risk groups. Um, and, but perhaps most importantly, TB screening can help address the global case detection gap, or what we call sometimes the missing millions. And we know now that, uh, as, as in 2020, with the disruptions from the COVID-19 pandemic, only about 5.8 million out of estimated 9.9 .9 million incident cases 
were diagnosed and reported uh, to the WHO. So now we see a global case detection gap of over 40%. And this is just briefly to remind everyone that um, uh, for the NTD strategy, our targets are by 2025 to reach 90% uh, contact investigation coverage and 90% treatment coverage. Um, and again, as of 2020, our treatment coverage was only about 59%. So we have a long way to go in terms of reaching everybody with TB. So uh, because of these roles that TB screening uh, plays in global TB care, uh, the WHO first released recommendations and guidelines for TB screening in 2013. And in the years since then, there's been some further evidence that has come out um, and more develop, further developments in screening tools and technologies. Uh, so for these reasons, in 2020, WHO convened an expert group to consolidate and update the guidelines and bring them in line with the latest evidence and uh, look at um, some new tools and some specific um, guidance for, for certain risk groups for screening. So these um, updated guidelines you see here uh, came out uh, for World TB Day this year. They can be accessed at uh, this website you see on the screen. They're also available now on the TB knowledge sharing platform. And so now I'm just going to briefly summarize what these recommendations are. So the guidelines consist of uh, two groups of recommendations. Uh, one group of people, uh, uh, populations or risk groups who should be screened and one group of recommendations on what tools should be used to screen them. So there are four populations in which TB screening is strongly recommended, and they include household and close contacts of TB patients, people living with HIV, minors exposed to silica dust, and prisoners. Um, prisoners, this, this recommendation has now been updated to a strong recommendation. So for these groups, screening should always be conducted uh, in all contexts. The question is more of how it should be done based on the, the local setting and, and the resources available, what tools and algorithms should be used, what implementation model and with what frequency should it be done. For these populations, TPT should be provided when appropriate. And we know of course that uh, close contacts and people living with HIV are primary populations for TB preventive treatment. And monitoring and evaluation, of course, should always be conducted uh, to monitor the outcomes of a screening program and to help uh, uh, update implementation uh, according to, to the results. So there are also some populations in which TB screening is conditionally recommended. And they include people uh, seeking healthcare or who are already in healthcare who have risk factors for TB. And this is in all settings with 0.1 TB per, uh, percent TB prevalence or greater, which is about 100 per 100,000. Some of the risk factors include malnourishment, include diabetes, history of previous TB, chronic lung disease, and there are many others. Um, the most relevant risk factors will be specific to the setting in which the screening is being conducted. One uh, risk factor which, uh, for which people should always, uh, or people who have this should always be screened for TB uh, is uh, people with untreated fibrotic lesions on chest X-ray. Um, these people are usually identified through screening or clinical care, but they are at high risk of developing TB in the future. So also populations with structural risk factors for TB, uh, and this usually goes along with limited access to healthcare. These groups um, also have a conditional recommendation for TB screening, and this includes urban poor populations, homeless communities, refugees, migrants, or any other vulnerable or marginalized groups. This could also include rural or, or isolated populations with, with little access to healthcare. And finally, TB screening in the general population uh, or sort of community-wide screening is also now recommended in settings with a prevalence of 0.5% or higher. And this is 500 per 100,000. So again, in these groups, uh, these are conditional recommendations. So consideration needs to be given to weighing the benefits and the risks of screening and uh, considering opportunity costs uh, for other TB interventions or other healthcare interve interventions, as we know that the TB screening is a resource intensive activity. And so because of this prioritization really needs to be done to make sure that TB screening is targeting the populations that have the greatest burden or the greatest vulnerability in a specific setting. 
Now I'll briefly go over the screening tools that are now recommended. So uh, all of the following tools are conditionally recommended um, based on the, the resources that are available and the populations being screened. So symptom screening is uh, a recommended tool, and this can be a number of different modalities. It can be screening just for prolonged cough or any cough, or it can be screening for any one of, of multiple TB symptoms. Um, and we know that TB screening is uh, of, uh, using symptoms um, is not as accurate as some other screening tools, but it is uh, feasible and easily implementable in just about any setting. Chest x-ray is a recommended screening tool. And we know that this uh, has a, a higher sensitivity and accuracy, and it also uh, can, can sometimes detect TB in people prior to the onset of symptoms, uh, which is uh, obviously a bonus. And now lastly, molecular WHO recommended rapid diagnostic tests, such as expert are also now uh, conditionally recommended for screening. So specifically in people living with HIV, we also have some tools that are uh, recommended for screening in this population. Um, the WHO recommended for symptom screen, which is screening for any one of cough, fever, night sweats, or weight loss is still recommended. This has been the recommended screening tool for people living with HIV since 2011. And it is still, um, uh, of course, a, an easily implementable and easily repeatable screening tool. However, we also now have some other options for screening people living with HIV. Chest X-ray is also recommended. We see this can increase the sensitivity of screening, particularly among people who are enrolled in ART care and regularly, uh, regularly coming to health to healthcare uh, centers for for visits. C-reactive protein is also now recommended as well to screen people living with HIV. This is a, a blood biomarker test um, that can be done as a, a point of care test using a, um, a finger prick of blood, as you see in the indication here in many settings. Um, and this tool we see really uh, improves the specificity of screening, um, specifically among people who are newly enrolled, enrolled in uh, ART care. Um, now, lastly, um, also molecular WHO recommended rapid diagnostic tests are also recommended for screening people living with HIV as well. And in fact, they are strongly recommended for screening medical inpatients, so severely ill patients in high TB burden settings um, as basically a, a way to really rapidly go on to a, a treatment among this very ill and very vulnerable population. Now, computer-aided detection uh, for automated interpretation of chest X-ray um, is also now for the first time recommended, and this is an option as an alternative to human interpretation of chest X-ray for TB screening and TB triage. And this is for all adults aged 15 years or older. This includes people living with HIV and, and not. Um, uh, and this is a really exciting development as, of course, we know this, this expands the, the scope of where TB screening can be conducted uh, to areas where perhaps the human resources are lacking for widespread use of chest radiography for screening, uh, specifically uh, radiographers or technicians who can interpret chest x-rays. Um, and I just have a couple resources included here if you want to see uh, first a landscape of the various CAD software programs that are available. Um, and also a, a toolkit developed by the, the uh, Tropical Disease Research Program at WHO. Um, we will be talking a lot more about that later today. Now, lastly, tools for screening children. There are two groups of children in which TB screening is strongly recommended. They include contacts of TB patients and children living with HIV. Um, and so the tools recommended for these groups uh, for child contacts, we have uh, strong recommendations for symptom screening and use of chest x-ray. And for HIV, we, uh, children with HIV, we have strong recommendation for symptom screening and screening for previous contact with the TB patient. Unfortunately, we don't yet have enough data for the technological development for some of these other newer tools to be used in children, but hopefully we'll see this uh, happen soon. And we know this is a, a fast moving area in terms of development. So lastly, I'm just gonna go through some of the principles and the ethical uh, um, considerations specific to screening. Um, and so we have a set of principles for TB screening that screen, TB screening should be done with the intention to follow up with appropriate medical care. 
And we have to remember this is important for TB screening as most of our tests are nonspecific. So we might uh, encounter people that have other health uh, uh, considerations or conditions going on that will need further care, not specifically TB. Uh, so we need to make sure that we accommodate for that in TB programs. Screening should be done to reach those at the greatest risk of TB disease. So this involves prioritization in the setting uh, where screening is being done. We'll discuss this a bit more later as well. TB screening needs to follow established ethical principles for screening, including voluntary informed consent, observing human rights, and minimizing the risks of discomfort, pain, stigmatization, and discrimination. And we need to take these seriously as we know the vast majority of people that we screen will not have TB. The choice of algorithm for screening needs to be based on the accuracy of the test as well as availability, feasibility, and, and costs. Uh, again, we'll talk a bit more about that later. TB screening really should be synergized with other health and social services, if at all possible, um, rather than having it be a standalone activity. And it needs to be designed to try and maximize coverage and frequency. One-off screening programs are really very rarely um, sufficient and appropriate for, for tackling the, the TB situation in any given setting. So lastly, a few ethical considerations specific to TB screening. It should be done to benefit individuals and communities. So to help individuals with TB be found earlier and, and reduce their, their costs and risks of catastrophic costs, and to help reduce the level of TB in the community, rather than being done to exclude entry or employment or to discriminate against individuals. Screening programs need to follow established human rights principles, including consent, non-coercion, and confidentiality. Confidentiality, And screening needs to be done voluntarily. And in order for that to happen, informed consent needs, needs to be done that includes communicating the uncertainties inherent in TB screening, which we know uh, is an issue since we have imperfect tests, of course. And screening programs, again, need to be done to make all possible efforts to minimize risks of discomfort or stigmatization. So with that, I would just like to thank uh, WHO staff at the HQ regional and country offices and all the expert individuals and groups who contributed to the guideline update. And I'll say thank you very much and look forward to the rest of the... Oh, actually, no, now I will ask for the polls to be put up, please. And we will make sure that uh, folks have been paying attention. So can we see the first poll? Okay. So for which population is TB screening strongly recommended? So let's see if everybody can click in what they think the answers are for this one. Can you, can everybody see the poll? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I can't. Oh, OK, I see only if. OK, I see some people are starting to respond. OK, and the second question is, which screening tools are recommended for adults and adolescents living with HIV? And there are a list of options there. So I'll give people a few minutes or a few seconds more to log their answer. And OK. Maybe now can we go ahead to display the answers? So the first question, for which populations is screening strongly recommended? Sorry, Cecily, the answers are still coming in fast. Just wait okay. a second. OK, that's fine. We only have half of the participants that have answered so far. OK, then let's wait a, a bit longer and let people respond. There's a break. So I'll display the answers. Okay. 
Okay, so for the first question, so now I think I think the poll is done. So for the first question, we see um, most people got the right answer, which is that uh, answer uh, B is the group of populations uh, for which screening is strongly recommended. They include household contacts, people living with HIV, prisoners, and minors. The other populations uh, have screening recommended conditionally. So the next question, which screening tools are recommended for adults and adolescents living with HIV? I think, uh, I think the majority got that question correct as well, which is A, the WHO recommended four symptom screen, C-reactive protein, chest x-ray, and I'm sorry, the rest of them are cutting off on my end, but I think people... I think people got the answer. I th it's uh, it should be C. Um, oh, oh, with all the yeah, okay. which says well, yeah. Okay. WHO four symptom screen, CRP, chest X-ray with or without CAD and MWRDs. And Cecily, do you want to maybe just explain about the role of LFLAM briefly because that was in answer A. Oh, which was okay. answered Sorry, quite a lot by people. No. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that's a very good point. So LFLAM is a diagnostic aid, which is recommended in, uh, in use for certain populations of people living with HIV, but is not recommended. In fact, it's recommend, there's a negative recommendation for using it as a symptom, as a screening tool. So LFLAM, again, is something to be used in diagnostic evaluation, but it is not to be used as a screening tool for people living with HIV. So I think with that, uh, we can end my presentation and go to the next um, and go to the next speaker. So thank you very much. Hi everyone. I hope that you can see my slide now. You need to be, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. So hi everyone. My name is Tu Aing and I'm from Woodcock Institute of Medical Research in Vietnam. Today I'm going to talk about how to share experience about how to develop and implement a TB screening program. So first of all, I have no conflict of interest to report. But you may have seen this uh, circle, this uh, infographic, the six essential steps in the uh, new WHO operational handbook on TB screening, uh, in which there are uh, six different steps. And in this uh, presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, the three steps, assessing the situation identify gaps. Second step is to set up goal specific objective and then planning, budgeting and implementing of the TB screening. So the first step, which is uh, very, very important is to identify the gaps. How, how do we know uh, about the gaps of the TB program? That could be done by a rapid assessment including review an, an annual report or monthly report of the national TB program, as well as the report from different uh, implementation partners. Uh, the rapid assessment could be done through a semi-structure or in-depth interview with people who involved in the TB program, or it could be a CAP survey among health workers, patient, and uh, their household contact to access the knowledge, the stigma related to access and use of TB service or TB screening. Uh, we can also explore the availability of the service, uh, the afford, whether the service is affordable, accessible, and what is the size of the population that we are going to uh, conduct TB screening. Uh, very important uh, factor is how expenditure or the cost for TB screening for one person uh, who may have to complete the whole TB screening process, which not only including screening activities, but also TB treatment. 
And then we may want to map the existing capacity, roles, and responsibility of different people involved in the TB screening program. This slide shows you an example of a TB cascade, which summarizes of the uh, rapid assessment of the gaps in the TB screening. Uh, we could present the finding or analyze the finding in different way, whether it's a form of a report with a lot of text or a table with number. But uh, for the, the implementation and designing uh, intervention that could uh, close the gap or narrow the gaps in the TB screening, a cascade of care uh, analysis could be uh, very helpful to use. On the left hand side is the graph of cascade of care for uh, TB, uh, active TB patient in India in 2013 uh, for the purpose of demonstration. And on the right hand side is the graph for the MDRTB patient. And you can see that at each uh, step, uh, one step uh, represented by one column. And at each step, there's a small a specific proportion of people who get lost in each step. And we, uh, through the uh, assessment, we could identify what is the reason for people to get lost on each step. This slide shows you an example of a generic model to be uh, casket of care. For example, uh, when people join step one, um, the, and move to step two, there is a gap that people cannot access TB diagnostic test. And through the CAP survey or in-depth interview, we may find a lot of reason. For example, uh, they fear they don't want to come for TB screening program. They don't have money to pay for transportation. They have to go to work. They think that TB is disease of other people, but not them. There are many, many reasons for people not coming to a TB screening program. And the second step is to map of the TB service. And by saying map is not only a geographical map with the position of each service, but also a list of a matrix that include information on who provide what service, where, for how many people that they could provide service for say half a day or a day, the cost of the survey as well as referral mechanism. If we want to design a TB screening by ourselves, going to community to uh, implement a TB screening campaign, then all the questions need to be addressed very well. Uh, different service uh, could include a symptom screening or a chest X-ray uh, and reading the chest X-ray a sputum test or uh, how to transport the sample, sputum sample to different labs, uh, who will do sputum culture, who will provide counseling for people who come for the screening or even people before the, uh, they come to the screening program, we may want to do counseling as a community to increase uh, the knowledge and the awareness for, for the people. We may also want to include different services into the TB screening, uh, such as the LTBI screening and treatment, or we could uh, also screen for other diseases like um, COPD and asthma or hypertension, or in the case that uh, the Vietnam team is conducting a study now, we screen for hepatitis B and C, which has a very high prevalence in the community. Although TB screening, uh, the purpose is to find the case. We also need to refer them to a treatment service as mentioned by CCV uh, at the first presentation. So we need to map who will provide the treatment, what is the cost for the treatment, uh, what test should be done during the treatment and who will pay for that and who store the drug, whether the drug is available through the whole course of treatment, who will provide support for adherence to the treatment as well as treatment for other diseases that was uh, that could be screened together with the TB screening program. So after identify the gaps and the situation, uh, we could uh, move to the next step is to identify solution uh, 
to identify a solution that is feasible and even if you want to make the TV screening as a routine activities and sustainable, it is recommended to conduct a stakeholder meetings um, to develop a program and the stakeholders not only including uh, health workers who provide the service, but also the manager of the health facilities who can make decisions on the human resource, um, on the treatment, on the equipment, on a different aspect of the TB screening. We need to also include government body who in charge of budget allocation, which I will talk about it as a last slide. Uh, we need to include the check X-ray technicians if we want to use check X-ray as a screening tool. Uh, we might want to include former TB patients as well, because they are very helpful to raise awareness in the community or in the screening population. Uh, they also understand how to design a TB screening service in the most friendly way. Uh, we might want also to include community organizations, civil society organizations to help and uh, all the partner stakeholders who come from public sector as well as private sector. Uh, this, uh, figure, this graph shows you an example of the different potential intervention that could be identified through such kind of meeting um, and address each gap in the cascade of care for example, a community-based active case fighting could help to address the issue of uh, people cannot come to the health facility due to long distance or they don't have uh, money to pay for transportation. Or if people uh, may uh, get lost uh, after uh, submitting the first sputum uh, sample for the test, then we may want to give the uh, test result on the same day. Uh, as well um, as other uh, gaps that we identify across the cascade of care could be addressed with a feasible a solution proposed by implementer and uh, by XTP patient and civil society organization. Another uh, point that the stakeholder could uh, discuss and decide uh, the models of the screening program it could be done at a health center. So anyone who come to the health center with a suspect symptom for TB could be screened for the TB. Or in many countries, uh, annual health check for uh, occupational screening is a requirement uh, for all of the uh, enterprises. We could include the TB screening into annual health check. Uh, another screening is to uh, conduct at the home particularly of the household contact of active TB patients who may want to hide uh, their situation because of stigma and discrimination. Uh, we could also conduct a mobile outreach screening campaign with which our team is working now in Vietnam. Uh, and it uh, could have to yield uh, the uh, TB active, active TB case fighting uh, very high, and it could also address the issue of uh, not being able to screen people who are asymptomatic, uh, as mentioned in the, the chat discussion. We could also do a community-based screening event, and the screening program uh, could also depend on the situation, the context. Uh, we could also include it in the nursing home, pediatric hospital, or a COVID-19 screening program or in the NCD uh, screening program as well. And in this slide, you can see the picture of health worker who screened for active TB uh, among people who came for COVID vaccination campaign uh, in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. Uh, on the right hand side is the integration of active TB screening with the LTBI screening uh, in the uh, ACT4 study in Vietnam, in which the household contact of index patients are invited, are ident were, in, were identified, were invited to the district TB unit and was uh, conducted uh, several tests to identify if they have active TB or LTBI, and if they are eligible, they will be provided treatment at the same location.
So once we uh, decide on what to do, then the next step is to plan. Planning process is, um, we have to plan on all the activities that we, we have done, but very important is we need to inform the leaders uh, in the TB program, as well as the uh, geographical area, the one who make decision on the cost, on uh, how to implement, if you want to do a TB screening and large scale. Uh, we need to decide on the screening algorithm, which will be discussed in the next presentation. Uh, very important that we need to uh, draw or develop a patient flow to make the service one-stop shop, the service need to be friendly, convenient, accessible for people to come there. We need to train uh, staff on the procedure, not only the um, professional training on TV and how to read, read check X-ray and how to obtain sputum, but also the whole process to make it smooth. We need to uh, make sure that equipment and uh, supply and consumable are available before the TB screening um, implementation. And we need to develop MOU agreement contract with different, um, different stakeholders involved in the TB screening program and design financial mechanism, who will pay, how to pay, and how to make the TB screening uh, sustainable, uh, which I will discuss at the last slide as well as a plan for monitoring and evaluation and management of performance. Uh, once everything is ready, then we implement it. We can uh, do a pilot uh, program, uh, get the feedback from uh, different people involved in the program, including those who are screened, and make adjustment for the designing of the TB screening program. And then we could monitor performance using the cascade of care approach, which we use uh, at the beginning for identify the gaps uh, when uh, making, when drawing the cascade of care, uh, staff who involved in the TB screening could discuss and identify issue. And uh, as a TB manager, we could also coach people to uh, develop solution and address it. Uh, in the graph, you could see that the blue uh, column represent people who attain each step in the cascade of care as a quarter one. And in the um, orange column is people in the quarter two who came for screening. And the gray column is people who come in the quarter three. And you can see that more people come in to, to the uh, screening at two different steps in the cascade of care, the TB screening, um, when we address the gaps in the implementation. And finally, uh, health financing and motivation for the TB screening program. If we have funding from Global Fund, USAID, Top TB Partnership, that's great. But we need to think about how to make TB screening uh, routine and uh, sustainable. So uh, the best way is we need to look at the reimbursement mechanism in each country. Uh, we look at policy and regulation, and we could match the needs of TB screening program with the existing regulation or package of service and adjust that mechanism uh, so that the people could use the existing funding from that the government agency to pay for TB screening. We could also look at the financial incentive for the system and for the staff based on the hospital financing mechanism. This example specifically for Vietnam may not be applicable for your country, but it is just an example to show you. Uh, for example, the reimbursement for TB service uh, is seen as to increase the hospital income. Therefore, TB service is seen as kind of positive image and the hospital manager think that the TB screen service is important to be implemented as well as other programs for like cancer or hypertension. Uh, better TB service may, may attract more people who come for TB screening and therefore hospital could have more income. Hospital can then invest their income for the TB unit, for the TB staff, 
or even involve a health worker in different departments to conduct the TB screening as well. And TB staff, especially in Vietnam, were subsidized by the national TB program. Now they are not seen as people who only spend money but also contribute income for the program and for the hospital. And finally, we need to look at the health insurance mechanism uh, to see if uh, the, pro the health insurance could reimburse for uh, different component in the TB screening program to make it sustainable. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And now we have a poem of two questions that I'd like to invite you all to give a try. The first question is, which of the following facilities should participate in a TB screening program? I hope that you all can open the slide door. For... Uh, these, these polls are directly in the Zoom, actually. Uh, yeah, sorry. Oh. The... Yeah. I... Zoom. Yeah. The second question is, which of the following activities should be done as a first step when designing a TB screening program? Okay, we have eight people giving their opinion. So what do you think, which of the following facilities should participate in a TB screening program? Um, what should be done? What should be done first when we design a TB screening program? Well, I think that 57% of people participated. in the call and uh, with the first question, I think that the right answer is D. Uh, we need to have a network of facility and organization to involve in the TB screening program. Otherwise, uh, we will not be able to access a lot of eligible population um, to, to screen for active TB. And with the second question, the, the right answer is to access the situation and gaps of the pre-intervention screening program. Once we know the situation, then we can move to the next steps. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we can uh, probably move on now to uh, the Q and A session. Um, this group seems to be a little shy of asking questions. I'm seeing very few questions that have been posted onto the chat. Uh, so I would urge that uh, all of you, um, as you listen carefully to what is being said, uh, also think through questions that uh, uh, you may want to ask so that we can have uh, an interactive session as much as, uh, as possible. Um, there are one or two questions that have come through all the same, and I'm going to ask the first question to Cicely. Um, we know that WHO has recommended that we can use MWRDs as uh, screening tools. 
And if we are using them under those settings, what should happen next? Should we do another MWRD diagnostic test? So for example, if we're using expert, uh, many of us know expert as the test that when it is positive, that individual has TB. Uh, but if we are using it as a screening tool, uh, that means that we should do a repeat expert. Cecily, please. Yes, that's a very good question. And I think you um, exactly highlighted the, the, the considerations here in that we are familiar, most familiar with expert as a diagnostic tool. Uh, which is when it, you know, its result is is actionable. But in in uh, in the screening scenario, we're using it as a screening test. Importantly, we're using it on a different population that has a different uh, spectrum of disease, and so the test has uh, slightly different performance characteristics in terms of sensitivity and specificity, and it needs to be treated as a screening test. So we need to confirm and make sure that a positive screening test result of an MWRD actually does indicate TB. So it needs to be followed with a diagnostic evaluation. And what that is, um, you know, it's still early days in this, uh, sort of in this scenario. So we can't say for sure, but it could include a number of things. It could include a repeat test on, on a different uh, sample. It could include diagnostic evaluation with chest X-ray um, and, and uh, sort of other um, clinical considerations. Basically, it needs to ensure that the, the patient presentation is consistent with TB and we're not seeing a false positive result uh, or, or remnants of a, of a past, um, uh, past TB, uh, you know, sort of dead bug still, still in the sputum. There is one exception to this, and that is when we're screening people living with HIV uh, in patients, so severely ill uh, patients in high burden settings. In this one population, we're seeing this sort of more as a fast track to diagnostic evaluation. That's the only situation in which we can consider this as a, a, an actionable diagnostic result. Thank you very much, Cecily. Um, I see now lots of comments coming in through the chat, which is uh, great. Alfred Keter is uh, uh, suggesting that uh, um, a positive test, uh, expert test may not necessarily mean TB, could be dead germs, um, and so on and so forth. Let me ask the second question. Um, we know, uh, and I, I would like both of you to answer this question. Any of you can go first. We know who to screen. We've been asked, we've been guided by WHO, and we've been told these are the people that we need to screen. We know what to do with the people uh, in terms of what to screen them with. But there may be a little bit of, um, uh, I don't know what your experiences are or what you would suggest countries do uh, in terms of screening those vulnerable populations. So not the ones that are top priority, not the contacts, not the HIV infected individual, but let's say slum dwellers. You've got a million slum dwellers. What should be the approach to ensuring that if you're going to start a screening program in that population, you eventually end up with really a high coverage? That's a great question. Uh, Dr. Wynn, I don't know, do you want to um, jump in for this one? Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. It's a very, very important question, at least for the country where I, I'm living in now, which is Vietnam, and I often go to remote areas. There's a lot of poor people, uh, people who are not registered uh, with the government. So there's no list of people, such situation to conduct a TB screening or to even invite them for TB screening. And uh, I think that the best approach is to work with the civil society organization in that area to identify who are vulnerable population. And uh, secondly, civil society organization can also help us to identify the need of that population. And uh, instead of doing or introducing TB screening as the only intervention for that population, we need to think as an integration approach to have that population to 
to address the healthcare needs in general, including TB screening, that would attract a lot of vulnerable people to come. Another approach is community screening uh, program in which we could um, do a census of people in that um, area and then uh, bring the service uh, near their door and inviting them to join the TB screening and even can, we can give them some incentive so that they could join the TB screening program. Thank you. Any further input, Cicely, before we move on? No, I think that those are really good points, it, especially in terms of integrating with it with other with other programs um, and and working with with organizations that that work in in these communities, and re remembering that that TB might not be very high on people's priority list in terms of when we're approaching people for screening, they might have a lot other more pressing considerations and, and I think we need to be mindful of that. I am looking at the time and I think maybe our 10 minutes is already gone. So I am going to move us uh, to, I hope we will have a little more time in the next uh, Q&A session. Uh, so I would like to move us now to the next presenter, uh, Saskia. Thank you. I hope you can all see my screen now. Um, so, so um, let me just move this there. So uh, today I will be talking about um, a bit uh, tagging onto the previous presentation and go in a little bit more detail on uh, prioritizing populations and risk groups and choosing tests and algorithms for screening. And I will also explain the screen TB tool which is an online tool that was especially developed to support uh, decision-making um, regarding screening populations and algorithms. I have no conflicts of interest to report. So in the operational handbook that was published alongside the screening guidelines, information is provided on how to design and implement a screening program. And this includes considerations for identifying and prioritizing risk group, which is here uh, shown as step three in the screening and implementation cycle, and on choosing algorithms for screening and diagnosis, which is step, step four. So risk groups beyond that, those that should always be screened, as mentioned by Cecily in her presentation, should be prioritized according to local epidemiology and the goals of screening, and the focus should be on uh, reaching the people at greatest risk for TB. Uh, it should also be considered that while screening offers benefits for the individual, it may also carry a risk and cause harm, while the benefits of screening may also be seen at population level as a reduction in prevalence and transmission. Then, as just mentioned by Tuan, there are also the costs of screening, which are determined by the total potential yield and the number needed to screen to detect a true case of TB. Finally, when designing the screening program, uh, we also have to consider feasibility and acceptability of screening. Choosing an algorithm will also depend on the objectives of screening, on the risk groups that are selected and the prevalence of TB in these risk groups, and also the ability to engage these risk groups. It also depends on the accuracy and the yield of the screening and diagnostic algorithm and practical considerations, like I just mentioned, cost, availability, and feasibility. So here in this table, um, we see the accuracy of different screening tests that we evaluated for the guidelines for high-risk groups. And we can see that chest X-ray has a very high sensitivity and specificity compared to the other screening tests. So this is why chest X-ray is often a preferred screening tool. It can also pick up TB earlier before a person becomes symptomatic. Symptomatic uh, symptom screening, of course, has lower accuracy, but it has uh, the advantage of being uh, cheap and very feasible. So program may choose an algorithm that combines symptom and chest X-ray screening for different populations. And then this, these pictures will also be already been shown. We have to think about the screening program delivery. For contacts, are we going to begin in the patient's household to ensure high coverage and maybe use mobile chest X-ray? 
or are we going to transport contacts to a nearby health facility for chest X-ray? Mines may have facilities on site to conduct chest X-ray screening for employees, increasing the feasibility of chest X-ray screening in this population. And this way we can make considerations for each risk group that is considered for screening. Again, looking at the requirements for accuracy and considering feasibility and costs. Here are some examples of how screening tests can, can be combined into algorithms. These examples shown here are for any symptom, that's here, uh, and uh, chest X-ray. So we can have uh, a screening algorithm that consists of only one screening test. Here it's depicted as, uh, as um, symptom screening, but it could also be chest X-ray screening alone or screening by MWRD alone. And then people who screen negative uh, should be evaluated for TB if they are eligible for TB preventive treatment. And those who screen positive should get a confirmatory diagnostic test. So the second algorithm is a parallel tool where we use two screening tests in parallel. And if either or both of these tests are positive, the person should receive a confirmatory diagnostic test. Then there are also um, um, sequential positive and sequential negative screening algorithms where the second screening test depends on the results of the first screening test. And these, um, the, the order in which these screening tests are done will impact uh, also your, your accuracy and costs. So I just want to now uh, move to a description of the screen TB tool. This is a web-based tool that was developed uh, when we first published the screening guidelines in 2013 with the purpose to um, assist with prioritizing risk groups for screening and also selection of suitable screening algorithms for each risk groups. So the tool helps to generate estimates of the yield of screening interventions and cost and cost effectiveness as expressed as cost per case detected. So this allows to um, play around with different um, parameters and to, to see what, are, what the impact is on, on these outcomes. So here are the, the links. We can also put these in the chat. I'll do that after my presentation. Um, we'll put those links in the chat. So um, the screen to be tool produces estimates uh, of screening based on the size of the risk group and the prevalence um, the prevalence of TB, uh, of TB and the proportion of the risk group that can be reached and as well as the sensitivity <coughs> and specificity of the screening algorithm. The tool compi compiles data from several different sources, uh, including WHO and other global data repositories, systematic review data that was used to create the screening guidelines, data also from peer reviewed literature, and then finally data that the user provides. And the tool then uses these data to generate estimates of the yield of a variety of different possible screening algorithms in the country of interest, including tr uh, true positive and false positive cases, estimates of the total cost and the cost effectiveness. So I'll walk you briefly through how the tool works. It starts by the user setting the context by specifying the country in which the screening would occur as well as the risk groups the user wants to explore for screening. There are several recommended or default risk groups that the user can select from. Uh, and uh, these are also included in the, in the WHO guidelines. The tool then estimates the size of the selected group based on the prevalence of the risk factor. The user can also specify the exact size of the group to be screened if they know if they know the size of the group or if they want to pre-specify the size of the effort. The tool calculates risk group size in different ways, depending on the risk group. So for example, for household context, the tool uses the annual TB case notification rate and data on household size obtained from demographic and health surveys. Information on HIV prevalence is obtained from the WHO HIV database. And for some risk groups, the tool also relies on estimates of country prevalence from the user. Then in the next step, the tool estimates the prevalence of TB and the number of prevalent 
uh, cases of TB that are to be expected in the different risk groups. So this is then based on published data on the relative risk for tuberculosis uh, in, in that risk group. So for example, we know that people living with HIV have an estimated relative risk of TB of more than 20 compared to the general populations. And for other populations, we know that the prevalence is relatively consistent. For example, for household contacts, it's about uh, 3%. So for this risk group, we can use an absolute, absolute uh, prevalence percentage. But the user can also supply information because there might be prevalence surveys that inform this or other operational research uh, from which, uh, and it's of course better to use uh, uh, setting specific data if it is available. The tool then discounts the size of the risk group and the yield of prevalent cases to account for screening programs ability to reach a given risk group and then also the risk groups likely this to accept TB screening. So the reach is defined by the user and represents what portion of the risk group they think they can reach with a screening program. For example, we think that we can probably reach about 70% of household contacts, then we can add this to the tool. But we can also set the scope for the, for the project if it's predetermined and say we want to screen, for example, 10,000 minors, then that could also be put in. And data on acceptability of screening is estimated on, uh, on the data from a systematic review. The WHO Operational Handbook offers 10 different screening algorithms that uses the available screening and diagnostic tools. These algorithms uh, vary from low sensitivity to high sensitivity and from very cheap to very expensive. And the tool uses these algorithms as the default options in the, in the screen TB tool to, um, to, to calculate the output. And that's done as follows. The tool combines that information on the risk groups that I explained first. Um, with the information on the different, on the accuracy of the different algorithms to produce a number of estimates. These are the yield of true positive cases, the yield of false positive cases, the overall cost of the screening program, the cost per true case detected, and the number needed to screen to find one true case of TB. These estimates are then compiled in a table, but this may be difficult uh, for the user to make sense of. So the tool also produces a number of graphs to di help digest the results and to compare the different risk groups and screening algorithms. So I'll show some output. So this is the typical output from the screen TB tool. So there are four graphs on this screen for four different uh, risk groups that were entered. Um, and uh, within uh, each risk group, there are the 10 uh, graphs for the different, uh, the different algorithms. Um, let's have a closer view now at one of these graphs. So here the, the blue bar shows the uh, true positive yield and the dashed blue line at the top shows basically the maximum case detection or what are the total prevalent cases are. So ideally, we want the blue line to be as of the blue bars to be as close as the blue dotted line as possible. The pink section shows the predicted false positive yield, and this depends on the specificity of the screening alg algorithm and the prevalence of TB in the risk group. And it's and we see that, for example, in this fifth column. The, the pink section is almost as big or maybe bigger than the blue section, which indicates that there is almost an equal number of false positive tests as true positive tests. And this is something that the tool helps to bring to light because normally false positive diagnoses are not really visible when we conduct screening programs. But we do have to keep those in mind because they do have serious consequences for those who are incorrectly diagnosed um, with tuberculosis. They, they will receive um, uh, treatment possibly. So that helps, the tool helps to, to make that visible. Then this graph shows the, uh, on, the, on the vertical axis, the cost per case detected for each risk group. Um, 
and the risk groups are the different colored lines and again ac across the different algorithms on the horizontal axis. And similarly, in a similar way on the vertical axis, here's the number needed to screen for each algorithm for the different risk groups, allowing for easy comparison of algorithms and risk groups. So when considering the results of the tool, we should also consider the limitations. The tool relies heavily on several assumptions, both obtained from the user and from the available data. And the uncertainty in these assumptions is also, of course, compounded in the final results. What goes in, in the model, the data that go in the model, of course, determine the, the sort of quality and uncertainty of what comes out. So because of this, we recommend that the tool can be used uh, as an exploratory tool and not really for detailed planning purposes. But it is useful to repeat the different uh, estimates and to vary the different parameters and do a sort of sensitivity analysis so that you can see which inputs are most influential on the final estimates. Uh, and so uh, might also lead uh, to a decision to collect some more detailed data before doing um, detailed planning. And finally, in addition to these considerations as uh, cost and accuracy, there are also, of course, other uh, considerations uh, feasibility, but also equity and political will, for example. So with this, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Um, do I pass uh, on back to you, uh, Chakaya? Or are we going straight on with uh, Jake and then do the Q and A yeah. after? I think we have a poll for the participants. Yeah. The poll, yeah. Sorry, I forgot about the poll. <laughs> Let's do the poll. So the poll questions are: What what does the Screen TB tool do? And the second question is, where does the data come from that the screen TB tool needs to produce estimates? Yeah, I can see a lot of answers coming in, a lot of participation. And I think, yeah, everyone seems to be um, I think there's still some activity, so maybe I'll wait another few seconds. We're, we're only at 40% of the participants so far. Okay. So some more people want to answer the poll before we discuss. Okay, I think for the, so for the first question, what does the screen TB tool do? It does all of these things, helps with prioritizing risk groups, with the selection of screening algorithms, estimates the co uh, yield of screening interventions, cost and cost effectiveness, and allows for the comparison across risk groups and across screening algorithms. And where does the data come from, from the screen TB tool? Uh, that's answer C. Uh, multiple sources, including WHO and other data re 
repositories, systematic reviews, published literature, and data provided by the user. So thanks for participating. I think we move it on to Jacob. Sorry, I did this last time. And... Display setting on the top. Yeah. The next one, the next tab, display setting. Right. Display setting up. Display right setting. Above. The upper. Right above the cursor. Right above your cursor. Above the cursor. Yeah, I'm. I'm not. I'm not seeing anything. Display setting. Mm -hmm. Sorry. We cannot see it. Ah. Oh. Look at your other screen. Yeah. Okay. Can you see now? We can see your slide, but you're not in presentation mode. That's good. No, that's good. Yep. It works. <laughs> All right, for that. Um, hi, so my name is Jacob Cresswell. I work at Stop TV Partnership. Uh, and lead the TB Reach initiative. I have no conflict of interest to report. And I'll talk uh, for the next few minutes about m and &E, which is the, the logical next step um, from what, uh, what Saskia and, and, and others have, have discussed and, and kind of closing the loop uh, in, the, in, 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 the, in the process of, of screening or active case finding. Um, so just as a, as a background, uh, I think over the last 10 years now, since the, um, since the and, and, and the last eight years since the, the guidelines first came out on screening from WHO, uh, virtually all uh, national strategic plans for TB have different aspects of active case finding in them. And uh, as has been mentioned, there are many groups, especially key populations, hard to reach groups that can benefit from, from active case finding or, or, or screening. Uh, but it is, it's really important to be upfront and, and recognize that when compared to the standard of care or, or passive case finding, whatever we, we, are, we want to call it, screening or active case finding is going to be more expensive by definition, it will be there. There's no getting around it that it will be more expensive. So uh, there's there's a clear uh, guidance uh, as, as Cecily very nicely presented about which populations, um, oh, you know, and 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 Saskia talked about the the diagnostics as well. Um, but how it should be done is very setting dependent, and this is not a it's not a guideline that says you will do this and you'll get this kind of results. Uh, active case finding screening is incredibly uh, homogeneous and there will be many different approaches and you're highly unlikely to get the same results that have been uh, found in other countries or even other settings within, within a country. So uh, this is all just to highlight that the monitoring and evaluation of active case finding interventions is, is really critical so that you can document what works, what doesn't, and, and so that programs can change course uh, and, and, and make, make changes. So just very, um, very generally, and again, this, this is a topic that can, we can spend a lot of time on um, and we don't have. So we tend to think of a, the screening cascade uh, as as, a, as kind of a funnel. Uh, and you have people who are eligible for screening. Then you have the people you actually screen. You have people that are 
uh, identified with presumptive TB, meaning they screen positive. Then you have a, a group of people that are tested for TB that undergo some kind of diagnostic evaluation. You have people who are diagnosed with TB. You have people who then closing the link are initiated on treatment. And, and then finally, I think it's also quite important that, that we must treat people successfully. Uh, so this is the, the kind of funnel and hopefully it doesn't look exactly like this, but, but the idea is that there are, are you're, you're, you're whittling down uh, the system. And so we, we kind of use an inverted pyramid. And if, and if programs are able to capture information data at each one of these screening uh, each one of these points you will be able to identify a, a quite a large number of, of indicators that can help you uh, provide feedback on, on on the screening so just I don't know if you can see on the screen but but each one of them has a B C D E F G uh, and so you can look at B over a is 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 something uh, similar to to an acceptance or an acceptability. Um, you can calculate things like number needed to test, number needed to treat. Uh, Pre-treatment loss to follow-up is, is very important for screening. Uh, if you're going out and making the, the, the efforts to identify people, ensuring that, they're on, uh, that they are linked to treatment and initiate treatment is, is, is critical, and of course, uh, treatment success. And this is something that, that we use uh, at, at the TB Reach. Uh, for all of our interventions, we, we actively uh, monitor these um, uh, with all of our projects. So just to talk uh, a little bit about them the individually, the, these, these basic indicators, um, if, you, if you look at the, the number of, of people who you're trying to reach, the, the coverage, uh, or the people that are eligible, and then you, you look at how many you, you've actually screened, it, do, it may give you a, a sense of, of how well you are, um, you, your, the, the buy-in from, from the, the population that you're, uh, that you're trying to screen is, how, how good that, that the, those uh, linkages have been made in the community. Uh, it also gives you a sense of, um, of the coverage overall in terms of the, the population that you're trying to reach. Uh, the, the presumptive rate, is something that we look at um, how, and, and it really depends on, on, on your screening test that you're using. So is your screening test identifying a very large number of people, uh, like any symptom? Uh, you may get a very high proportion, uh, and you may, or you may be looking at a, a chest X-ray that has a very high uh, threshold score with, with artificial intelligence, and so your, your, your presumptive rate is, is very low. So it, it, this is generally focused on, on, on the screening test done. Another one that, that is often overlooked, but um, the, the proportion of people who have presumptive TB that you're able, actually able to capture uh, or, or get sputum from. Uh, and this can be, this can be uh, there can be many reasons for this. Um, early active case finding, people can tend not to produce sputum. But you also have to look at the quality of the sample. So, are, is the laboratory accepting saliva, a salivary sample? So, there's a, there's a, there's a lot that can be uh, looked at in if you're looking at sputum capture. And then a lot of what we we hear about and, and has been mentioned, number of needed to screen, uh, number needed to test. Uh, not, and I and I, I have a, a couple of notes on this. Number needed to screen is is a crude measure of effort, um, but you really have to be to be careful when you're comparing this. It's not enough to say number needed to screen of 100 is better than number needed to screen of 200 because it really depends a lot on the, the intervention itself and the effort that it takes to do that intervention. And a, a very easy example is um, uh, household contact investigation. If you're going around visiting uh, contacts in their homes, is a lot uh, more um, intensive than doing screening at a outpatient facility um, uh, so that you can just do verbal screening at an outpatient. So just thinking about that. Um, again, number needed to test this. It's the same. It, it, it's a crude measure of diagnostic resource need. And then, and I've mentioned pretreatment loss, loss to follow up. Um, it's, 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 it's critical 
uh, for, for many active case finding projects. And so I just wanted to, to show an example of, and, and it was good, Saskia mentioned, mentioned the, the screen TB tool and, and, and a lot of the, 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 the models that we'll use will, will show you what ideally you will find. But the reality, as we know, is a lot messier. And um, here's a, two examples of two programs. One is they're both using chest X-ray as a screening tool. And then one is using smear microscopy, program A, and one is using expert, program B. And, and, and the algorithm will say, oh, well, you'll, you'll definitely have a higher yield. Um, you'll, you'll identify more people with, with TB in, in, in program B. But it really depends on your implementation. And this is where monitoring these tools, the, these uh, indicators are going to um, uh, help immensely. So you start with the exact same population with the exact same prevalence, you do the exact same test, and, and you can see for the first two columns, there's no difference. But, but as you go through, if you have dropouts, uh, people don't submit, you don't have good sputum coaching, you don't, you're not following up people, ensuring they get to the lab, you're not ensuring that people who are diagnosed get onto treatment, then you may end up with a more expensive, um, theoretically uh, more sensitive algorithm, but you have the exact same number of people on treatment. And of course, these numbers will vary, and it was, this is just a, 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 a basic example, but it, it's just to show that it's not just the screening tests that are important, it's the ability to implement the intervention. Um, so then just to, to turn to uh, uh, the, this idea of, of yield and, and how many people with TB that, that we're finding. You see a lot of um, uh, reports and, and, and on active case finding to say, well, we had 2% or whatever it is, 2.3% of household contacts had active TB, or we identified 86 people with, with, with TB in, in some screening event. Um, Expert machines are running at 90% capacity and identified 254 MTB positive cases. So that's that that gives you some bits of information. But if you're trying to evaluate a, a screening program, an active case finding program, with more efforts and, and, and more inputs going into it, then you really want to think about other measures of, of uh, other ways to evaluate the project because. In the vast majority of situations, and there are some that, 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 that won't fall into this, but very few, the vast majority, while you'll be identifying people earlier, anyone identified through a, 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 an active case on your screening process will be identified earlier than, than passive case finding by definition. How much earlier is, is, is hard to tell, but a lot of the people who you identify through active case finding or screening will eventually get into the health system anyway. And so we're, we try to think of different ways to look at um, uh, measuring this idea of, of your added benefit or your, your, the, the, the impact on, on, on case notification. And, and thinking, and, and one of the ways we do it is to think about um, having uh, a larger a larger level, larger population than just the population that you're screening. And so uh, for those of you who are familiar with TB Reach, we try to look at a, a population level impact on, on, on active case finding. And this is a, 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 an example that's very difficult to replicate, um, but just to show you uh, graphically how, how we look at it, you can look, you can control for trends, uh, historical trends you can control with a with a with a uh, contemporary control population, um, and the idea is that you have an intervention and then you ideally will see an increase. If you if if you do not see an increase in notifications, there's many potential reasons for it. Um, there there are many countries. Uh, before COVID was 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 part of our our lives, there are many countries that had for many years had declining rates of, of notification, for example. So uh, in, in Kenya and where, where Chikaya has been working, we saw uh, projects that he was looking at that were able to maintain the same uh, uh, 
numbers of, of notified patients are even increased a little bit, but compared to what you would expect when there's a downward trend, that's, a, that's actually quite a, a, a big um, uh, achievement, right? So looking at, looking at, at different ways to, to control that. The other thing that, that is uh, interesting to look at is um, this idea of active case finding uh, ratio to the overall notification. So is your active case finding project or intervention taking over the passive, the passive case finding? Is, it, is, is this in a remote area and, and you're all of the, the, the people that you're identifying, are they, are, that, those are in addition to the, the, um, the routine uh, notifications? Or is it is it is it taking really taking over uh, the and 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 public health facilities are seeing less and less people coming in and then there's the and then once you if you can calculate a a an, an additionality uh, that showing an increase in notifications is your is your yield is the is the yield that you're finding through the intervention um, uh, what 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 proportion of that additionality is 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 being um, found through the intervention itself? So uh, there's a, a lot of different ways uh, to look at it, and again, we unfortunately don't have enough time to go into to all of the details. But just to give you a sense of, of different things that that can be done, um, there's been a number of of reviews of active case finding versus passive case finding in terms of treatment outcomes that haven't shown. Um, a lot of benefit uh, at the moment, but I think the jury is still out and we'd like to see more uh, information coming from cohorts uh, of, of people actively versus pa uh, passively found. What was really nice, um, I don't think Cecily got a chance to mention it, but uh, in this WHO um, guideline update, one of the things that was included was the impact on catastrophic costs and active case finding really having an impact, a positive impact on, 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 patient, uh, on patient costs. So this idea, again, of reaching out to people, uh, it saves them costs, it, it diagnoses people earlier. Ideally, it will um, reduce transmission and, and lower mortality uh, 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 at, a, at a larger community level. Uh, much harder to identify, try to measure decreases in incidents and, and things like this. But there are many different uh, other types of measurement that, that can be done and imagined in an active case finding uh, screening program. So I just, I, I want to um, uh, close with just some, some thoughts uh, for any kind of, of intervention any kind of program that is going to try to improve TB case detection. And, and again, Cecily mentioned at the beginning, this is something globally now, we have an, uh, we've had for many years a huge gap, millions of people being missed, uh, it's worse now. And, 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 and for the efforts that are, that are going to be happening to, to try to improve case detection, um, thinking about how, how to monitor them. I, I think that there's only, there's three things that you can boil down in, in, in any uh, intervention that one of them must happen. And, and I think two of them are very relevant for active case finding. The third one is more around private sector engagement. So I, I won't get into that. But I, I have a hard time coming up with anything that will be done uh, in terms of improving case section that, that will not either involve testing many more people or improving or increasing uh, clinical diagnosis. Um, you, 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 there, there's, there was some, some uh, discussion around expert and improving the sensitivity of the diagnostic test. Uh, what we've seen uh, from, from data from countries is that it will improve the bacteriologically positive uh, proportion of overall cases, but there's not a, a huge impact on the overall numbers of people that are diagnosed with TB because uh, many people are diagnosed clinically. It's not the case everywhere. There's a few exceptions, um, but uh, overall test sensitivity is not going to, you're not going to get a, a big increase by, by testing more people with, with a sensitive test. So you have the, 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 
the big push here has to be testing more people. I don't, I, I'm not, I put increased clinical diagnosis because with children, people living with HIV, people with, there's a number of countries that have very low rates of, of clinical diagnosis. I'm not saying that we need to diagnose more people clinically. I'm just saying that if you test the same number of people that you do now, the only way to improve uh, notification is to diagnose more people clinically, right? So there has to be a huge increase in, 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 uh, in testing at laboratories. The laboratories must be prepared for that. Uh, and it should be monitored. And, and you should be thinking about uh, how, how that will impact what you want to do, the costs associated, um, and, uh, and, and, and plan for it. So um, I, I, I think this is my, my last slide. Um, it's important to note that that active case finding, as I said at the beginning, is not, it's not, you have this input and you will get this output. Every situation is going to be different. And if you use M&E and, 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 and monitor these, these different indicators, you'll be able to identify uh, changes that are needed. And th these aren't studies, these aren't uh, uh, protocolized uh, approaches, and you should be able to, to, to change. Um, Collection of data, there's so many apps now and, and uh, the ability to identify people uh, throughout that cascade. There's so many uh, um, options for being able to do this electronically and uh, it will help immensely. So just a, a, a big push for uh, the use of, of uh, electronic data um, and being able to, again, use this data, inform uh, people who are, are doing the, the interventions on uh, feedback to them on, on how, uh, on the performance and, and things that could be improved. And then I think there was a, a question even in the, in earlier in the, in the chat about, uh, about the, how often we should do active case finding and, uh, or, you know, kind of screening events. I don't think we really have a good answer for that. There's some interesting data on, on, on contact investigation, but overall in general, larger kind of active case finding Events, I, I think we don't really know the answer, but with a backlog of of, um, of prevalent TB in communities, it's often that you see an initial um, uh, jump in in case notifications when you do active case finding because there's a lot of people who are who are, who are not being uh, identified that have TB, and then that can drop off over time because you identify people who are, are prevalent cases in in the, in the communities, right? So thinking about if you're doing the same types of interventions, tracking over time, number needed to screen, number needed to test, and see how these things change uh, will also help you uh, in, your, in, in your interventions. Uh, and then finally, as we, as we do get closer and closer to identifying everyone, it's gonna get harder and harder. The marginal um, costs and, the, and, 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 and effort needed to identify an, uh, another person with TB are, is, is going to grow uh, and you'll need to test many, many, many more people to, to find those, those last few. But I, we're, we're far from there. But uh, just again, to keep in mind that as we move forward, it's, it's going to get harder, it's gonna get costlier and we need to be again, aware. So I think that's, that's it for me, thank you. And I actually had some poll questions that I wanted to ask first. Um, we can put them up now. Uh, I, I guess I gave away some of the answers, but, um, but uh, anyway, if, if, if uh, we can have some time to just. Uh... Well, questions are just up.
All right, I think people are, are getting tired of the poll questions. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to, um, and I, I, I'm not sure how we are on time, <laughs> but, um, but uh, I, I think the, the first question I, I, I wanted to um, just mention that it's hard, that the answer really is that it's, it's hard to tell. Uh, if intervention, um, normally everything being considered, uh, you would want a lower NNS. Uh, it's 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 more cost effective. Uh, everything else being considered, to have a, a lower uh, NNS. But if you have, again, if you're if you're doing something um, in in intervention um, B, uh, that is verbal screening at a place where it's easy to access many people, then uh, and intervention A is uh, incredibly um, HR. Uh, heavy, then then maybe uh, it's it's actually it's it's actually intervention B. So it just again to think that NNS in in it in and of itself is not a great um, is not a great indicator. You need a little bit more 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 context. Um, the the I think um, all of the the there's so many different uh, indicators that that can be useful. So uh, I I. Um, I, I hope the 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 ant, people who answered F were, were just um, hit the, the wrong key, but th they all can be useful. And number needed for the positivity rate uh, is would be um, uh, B. The number needed, the number of people tested, uh, and the number of people with TB. So it's it's really focused on 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 the laboratory part, but it's certainly important uh, number of people tested and the number of people enrolled on treatment. If you don't enroll those people on treatment, um, it's, uh, it, it doesn't matter if, if they made it to the lab or the sputum made it to the lab. Anyway, um, I will stop there and uh, hand back to Chikana. Thank you, Dr. Um, this is gonna be the time for a, a, a short break of five minutes. Um, so participant, I recommend that you do not log off from Zoom meeting. I'm going to display a countdown slide for your convenience so you will know when to resume um, the course. Thank you.
Welcome back. The course will now resume. And prior, I hand it over uh, to uh, Professor Shakaya. I just want to remind participants uh, to share their challenges and experiences of screaming using the um, Slido. Thank you. Thank you again. And uh, um, great talks, everyone. And thank you for staying with us up to this point. Um, I think uh, we've had a lot of discussions already on the chat, um, very few questions that have come through. However, I think maybe we can probe a little bit on this issue of how often people should be screened um, if we are going to reduce the uh, rates of TB in the populations we are interested in. And I'm just wondering whether um, uh, Guy or, or, or Dr. I don't know how to pronounce that name, so please forgive me if I pronounce it very poorly. Nguyen is still here. Uh, maybe to tell us a little bit about their um, you know, program in Vietnam uh, and what happened there. Just very, very briefly, and then we can move on. Because I think, I think we may have some answers to try and drive us towards that, uh, you know, how often we should be screening populations. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a very good question, and I don't think we know the answer for certain. Um, and, uh, and I think it probably differs according to a number of measure, knowable characteristics of the population. The most obvious one is what is the actual incidence of new cases, how much transmission is going on and what is the incidence of new cases because that will determine the the rate at which the cases that you find by active case finding are replaced by new cases that need to be found and therefore the the more the higher the incidence rate the more frequently you need to um repeat the screening or the active case finding in order to sustain a low prevalence of disease. And it's the prevalence of disease, remember, that is what is causing transmission. It's the prevalent cases in the population, the number of people in the population at any given time who have active TB that, is, that are um, causing transmission of, of cases, are responsible for transmission of cases. So if you screen the population and move, remove most of the active cases, then for a period of time, there will be very little transmission until they get replaced by new incident cases, new cases. So the answer to your question, Chakaya, is that in the study that we did in, in Vietnam that Tuang was referring to uh, a little, um, we, we screened 
every 12 months. We did it at 12 monthly intervals, but it may not be necessary to do it that frequently, or although, and there may be other settings where it's a good idea to do it even more frequently. But what we chose at that time was 12 monthly screening. Thank you. I think we should probably move forward. I, 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 and I wish uh, someone was here to talk about the uh, experience in the Zimbabwean and the Harare slums in the Detect TB program, because again, they did repeated screening there. So it does appear to me that uh, uh, we cannot screen once and stop there. It's just how often should we do it? That, that's, a, that's a big issue. I, I think we should now move, on, move, move it on to Vanessa, because we're running out of time. Great, thanks. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, um, can everyone see and hear me? Okay. Yes. Perfect, thank you. Um, well, hello everyone, and it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, I will be presenting just, yeah, um, on the implementation and calibration of CAD software to, for TB screening or TB triage. Um, so as Guy said, uh, my name is Vanessa and I'm from the Special Program for Research and Training in Tropical Diseases at WHO. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Uh, Okay, so as we've heard already today, and as I'm sure you're all aware, WHO has recently released updated guidelines for TB screening. And these guidelines for the first time have recommended the use of CAD um, in place of human readers for individuals aged over 15 in both screening and triage settings. So for those of you who may be unfamiliar or less familiar with CAD, CAD stands for Computer Aided Detection Software, and it's, um, it's a software program that uses artificial intelligence to screen digital chest x-rays for signs and symptoms suggestive of pulmonary TB. And so how it works is the CAD product um, interprets a chest x-ray and produces an abnormality score, typically between 1 and 100. And this score, when compared against a set threshold, can be used to signal probable TB and to initiate ongoing uh, further diagnostic testing. So the benefits of CAD are obviously um, in settings where screening um, is to be ramped up, for example, and in other settings where there may not be the required human resources necessary to interpret chest, uh, chest radiography. So the thing about um, CAD is that the diagnostic performance of this software can be influenced by many, many factors and settings, um, many factors that are specific to certain settings. And so these things may include uh, issues like the severity of TB disease in a certain population, the underlying TB prevalence, the presentation of TB in individuals who have certain comorbidities, and the proportion of lung diseases other than TB um, in certain populations. And so in order to effectively integrate CAD into a screening algorithm, um, there needs to be a threshold we, which incorporates many of these context specific factors um, to determine a threshold that will be used specifically in that setting to signal um, probable TB cases and trigger ongoing diagnostic evaluation. So when we talk about calibration, what we really mean is at what threshold will we use, will we consider a case um, to be abnormal? However, setting a threshold is a trade-off. It's a trade-off between the sensitivity and the specificity of, of CAD. And so, for example, um, if we were to set a lower threshold, that would give us a higher sensitivity um, and therefore a greater likelihood of identifying true positive cases but would also be associated with uh, greater costs associated with um, unnecessary testing among individuals who were identified as a false positive case. Conversely, if we had a higher threshold that would give us a greater specificity 
um, which would reduce the number of false positives, but also reduce the number of true positives that are captured. Um, so this would lead to a greater number of, of cases who are missed. And so because of these trade-offs, in order to determine a threshold, it really requires um, a national TB program or other users of CAD to decide for themselves what are the overall goals of our screening program, in particular, the use of CAD within this screening program, and what is acceptable to us in terms of the missed cases um, or the overall amount that we're, that we're able to spend, including um, the amount that we will spend on unnecessary testing. So uh, last year, at the beginning of this year, actually, we released it, um, TDR in collaboration with the Global TV Program and other external experts developed this toolkit in order to help um, CAD implementers address some of these questions. So it's a toolkit um, aimed at people or programs who have already made the decision to use CAD. So therefore, we assume that the users of this toolkit have a functional CAD set up um, in place already. And it really helps to support um, CAD users to conduct the calibration process. So the specific objectives are to help users understand threshold scores and what they mean in terms of programmatic implications. It aims to describe a simplified operational research protocol to conduct CAD calibration studies and to determine a CAD threshold. And it aims to support the analysis, interpretation, and application of the resulting CAD diagnostic performance data to enable that identification of an appropriate threshold. So the toolkit is available on the TDR website. I will link to it at the end. Um, and it comprises three parts. So part A is a background uh, document, which gives an overview of the calibration study. Um, discusses some of the complexities and the considerations that um, people will need to think through before performing a calibration study and a detailed description of the methods. Part B is a generic study protocol for the CAD calibration study. Um, this is also available as a downloadable Word version uh, that can be used to support um, an ethics application, for example. Uh, it can also be modified to to include the specifics of, of a, a calibration study. And finally, part C is a user guide um, to help people understand um, the analysis and interpretation of the data that arises from a CAD calibration study. And part C in particular was developed as um, an accessory to an online data analysis tool um, that we've developed and I will discuss shortly. Uh, that performs much of the CAD calibration study data analysis uh, on your behalf. So I'm going to spend um, just a few moments now talking about what the CAD calibration study is. Uh, overall, the aim of the CAD, so, sorry, could um, we just pop on mute, um, please? Thanks, I'll continue. Um, overall, the aim of the calibration study is to determine the diagnostic accuracy of the CAD software um, by comparing the performance of CAD against a bacteriological test um, at various thresholds. So for each individual, um, a bacteriological test is taken and the results of this are compared to the reading of CAD at various thresholds. And so by doing this um, for an entire sample of, of people, it allows us to determine the sensitivity and specificity of CAD at various thresholds. And from this, it allows us to understand what the programmatic implications of these various thresholds are in terms of um, the yield of true and false positive cases and the cost of diagnostic evaluation. So calibration studies um, are intended to be conducted in either a screening or a triage setting to be aligned with the, um, the updated WHO screening guidelines. Um, and it's, the study has been designed as an operational research study and the hallmark of operational research is obviously for it to be relatively simple um, to conduct and easy to integrate into routine practice. It's not, it's not a clinical trial. It's not, it's not a study that requires or demands really robust kind of scientific 
practices. Um, so the idea is that this is oh, fairly fun. easy to do and quick. And so because of that, there are very few requirements in terms of what data is needed for this study. We need um, chiefly key clinical and demographic patient variables, very few patient variables, age, um, some information on other comorbidities if it's of interest and relevant to your setting. Obviously, um, a chest, a digital chest X-ray, uh, which can be read by CAD or a CAD score if it's already been um, interpreted, and results from a bacteriological test result. Um, so this is this is it. Three main pieces of data needed for the calibration study, and so we propose two main ways to collect this. So in situations where none of this data is uh, pre-existing we can collect this through a cross-sectional study design. If you're in a situation where there is some data available, then a case control study can be, form, can be performed instead. So I'll just quickly um, describe what these two study designs would look like in practice. So the cross-sectional study design includes the prospective and consecutive recruitment of all eligible individuals in the setting where CAD is to be implemented. And so eligibility obviously will be determined based on local TB case finding definitions. And for both studies, we recommend um, limiting, limiting it to individuals aged over 15, again, to be uh, in agreement with the updated screening guidelines. So for this study, um, uh, the eligibility would be determined um, among individuals who are eligible, they will be enrolled, and then the patient data will be collected, a CRX will be performed and read by CAD, and sputum will be collected um, for bacteriological testing. So the advantages of this study design is it can be easily integrated into routine activities. It can, it can operate alongside regular TB program, for example, and it provides an accurate representation of how CAD will perform in the target population and setting. Um, the limitations of the study design, however, are that it, it has a greater requirement in terms of sample size, uh, which obviously will invoke greater cost and time requirements. It requires bacteriological testing among all individuals, uh, regardless of um, CRX reading or suspicion of TB, which um, obviously comes at a, a greater cost. So conversely, case control studies offer the possibility of using pre-existing patient data, provided that that data is high quality and it suits the, the needs and the requirements of this study. So we imagine two different scenarios here. There may be a situation where there is high quality data available only for those uh, individuals who have TB. So for example, OPD records, TB clinic records. Um, in this case, we would retrospectively, we would conduct a retrospective case control study where we would select um, known TB cases um, and sorry, that should say prospective selection of TB cases. This example here is for if we have data for both TB cases and non-TB cases, for example, a prevalence survey. So we could have retrospective data collection for all individuals required for this study. But as I mentioned earlier, if you're in a situation where you had good data only for TB cases, then you would use the historical data for the cases but at the same time do prospective selection or recruitment of, of individuals, most of whom will be um, free of TB and who would therefore act as your controls. So the advantages of this study design is that overall there's a smaller requirement in terms of individuals needed for this study and because we probably have data already on individuals who are known to be positive, there's a smaller number of confirmatory tests required, which obviously um, keeps the cost of the study design down. The limitations may be um, that there is some, some bias or some lack of representativeness in the pre-existing data that may um, skew results. 
Um, so the other thing that a program may be interested to do is to identify specific thresholds for use among certain subpopulations. And this is because we know that there are some characteristics that may influence the, the reading, the CAD reading and the accuracy of, of CAD. So these include age. Um, for example, there's some evidence, uh, though not really consistent across all technologies and settings, that CAD interpreted chest x-ray may be less accurate for detecting TB disease in individuals older than 80, 55. Um, additionally, there, for people living with HIV, the specificity of CAD uh, may be lower among, among these individuals compared to HIV negative individuals because of the, um, the presentation of TB in the lungs. And uh, with previous TB, again, there's some evidence that CAD interpreted chest X-ray may be less accurate for detecting um, TB in those with a history of TB because of um, lung scarring. So in the toolkit, we provide further guidance on, on how to conduct um, sub-analyses um, and also how to um, ensure that the data collected for the sub-analyses are sufficiently powered. So um, in addition to the toolkit, we've developed a range of um, accessories, I suppose, to help support the conduct of these calibration studies. Firstly, we have done all the calculations and the estimates for um, sample size calculations. And so in the toolkit, you, I won't go into detail, um, but you will find these tables where you can identify the required sample size based on your selected sensitivity and the study design that you've chosen. We have um, this data collection form, which can be downloaded and modified as needed and used to support the collection of those data elements um, from TB patients that I described earlier. And we have developed a, um, a CSV file for data entry. So this is where you can enter the data from the calibration studies and upload to the online data analysis tool um, for interpretation, which is um, what this screenshot is here. So I'm now going to spend the rest of my time just talking about this online tool. Um, and we will have an opportunity to use this and um, see some of its specific features in the breakout session, which I'll mention um, in a moment. So this tool um, has been developed, like I mentioned, to, to essentially perform the data analysis for a CAD calibration study. So it allows a user to upload a data set and uh, then this, this tool calculates the sensitivity and specificity of various thresholds um, in order to demonstrate what the implications of that are for a program um, in terms of the over and under diagnoses, the cost incurred related to confirmatory testing, um, the cost per case and the amount spent on, on over diagnosis. So um, the red bar along the top indicates the different functions of the online tool. And Sorry, I forgot to mention that the tool also allows you to, um, to adjust certain parameters based on your local setting. For example, the TB prevalence, um, the population size and the average cost for a diagnostic test. So the output um, is displayed in two key ways. So the first is um, this rock curve and so the rock curve plots the true positive rate against the false positive rate. Um, that maybe sounds a bit complicated, but the purpose of it is to really show the possible trade-offs between the sensitivity and specificity at, at various threshold levels. So this rock curve allows a user to click anywhere along the curve to show what the specific sensitivity and specificity is um, associated with that score. And the gray bars um, present the 95% confidence interval around those thresholds. Um, 
the second output, and I think this is probably the one that's maybe a bit more user friendly, I would say, is um, is essentially that data, but in tabular form. So this this table presents um, a number of variables um, that that illustrates in, in programmatic terms what what the different sensitivity and specificities mean. So. For example, um, you can see here it shows the number and percentage, the proportion of missed cases at various threshold scores, the total costs of confirmatory testing, the cost spent per case, the cost due to overdiagnosis, um, which is to say unnecessary testing of false positive cases. Oops, sorry. Uh, yeah. So. And there's the option here, which I haven't gone into, but of also producing the rock curve and the data output tables for subpopulations, um, which may be of interest to your specific setting. So the CAD calibration toolkit uh, and all of the accessories I just mentioned can be downloaded um, and accessed from the TDR webpage here. Um, this if you scroll down, there's a box on the right-hand side that links to, to all of the documents. Um, and I, I just wanna finish by saying that as this is a new toolkit, we are really interested in, in hearing from, from countries who are interested in, in performing a CAD calibration study. Um, and we're definitely available to provide any sort of assistance um, for the process. I think one of the advantages um, of this toolkit will really to be to demonstrate to other people who are considering it or using CAD, um, one, how, how easy it is, um, because I, I think at the beginning it sounds like it's potentially quite difficult and, and cumbersome and it, it's, it's not. So I think we'd really love to grab, to get some examples of people who have used this toolkit and, and the benefit that that would have for them. So. Uh, in the future, we're hoping to sort of establish like um, a community of practice where people can see the implications um, of the calibration from, from countries who, who have performed um, this process themselves. Um, just uh, to finish, this was um, a toolkit that was developed with the, the really um, significant involvement uh, from a range of, of people listed here who have serious experience using CAD um, or researching CAD. So yeah, it was definitely a, a joint effort and we gratefully acknowledge um, their contributions. Um, that's the end of my slide show. Now I'm going to stop showing my screen and I believe there is a poll to follow. Thanks for listening. Okay, it looks like we've got some good participation. Um, might just give a few more, few more seconds um, and then we can discuss the results.
okay um thanks everyone i think i might we can discuss that now Great, so um, the first question was, what are the factors that may affect, affect the performance of CAD in a particular setting? Um, the correct answer, which, uh, yep, most people got right, was E, all of the above. So the severity of TB disease, the underlying prevalence, um, the presentation of TB in comorbidities, uh, individual comorbidities, and the prevalence of other lung diseases. So well done on that one. Um, Question two is, it was a bit of a trick question. Maybe that wasn't very fair of me. Um, so the correct answer is C. So a lower CAD threshold gives a higher sensitivity and a lower specificity, which results in both a larger number of false positives as well as a larger number of, of true positives. So I think we can consider that the people who responded A and B were half correct. So well done. Um, now, I see there are a few questions, um, Saskia or Caroline, shall we move towards, okay, I think, unless you say, so I'm going to introduce the breakout sessions now. Yes, yes, yeah. that's a Great. good idea. Great. And we'll do it a little bit shorter, Vanessa, because uh, of time. So uh, okay. about 15 Great. minutes for the breakout. Perfect, okay. Um, so in that case, I am going to go quickly. The next um, and final part of this workshop will be the breakout sessions in which um, we're hoping to give participants an opportunity to uh, use and observe the tool that I just mentioned. So um, if you look in the chat, um, if not, ah, yes, okay. So in the in the chat, you'll find um, a link, a document that you can download. So there's it's the CAD calibration. Um, it's a dummy data set that we can use in the online tool. And um, can we just put the link, please, to the yes, the online tool? Okay. So the two documents um, that you may want to download is the the calibration um, dummy data set and the Word document which describes the case study. So. In a moment, we'll be put into breakout rooms and we, um, the facilitators will use the dummy data set that are here um, to demonstrate the online tool and how it works. And then there's some questions that we've included in the Word document that we will answer as a group. Um, so we thought it would be easier for us to demonstrate to the group how to use the online tool. Um, but you're more than welcome to, to use the tool yourself. You can follow along. We'll go slowly um, so that if you want to do it on your own computers alongside our demonstrations, please feel free. Uh, and then the idea is that we will um, spend the rest of the time just discussing some of the questions, uh, just to give you an idea of, of how to use the tool and then how to apply the, um, the output from, from the analysis. Um, so unless there's any questions, I think maybe we can move into, into the breakout rooms. I'm just gonna add a couple elements in regards to the breakout. So there are four different groups and you will be automatically and randomly assigned to a group. Um, please note that there will be a pop-up window that will appear once we've opened the room. You do need to click and accept the invitation to join the room in order for you to be then sent into your respective group. Thank you very much. Should I open the rooms now? Yes. Okay.
for participants still in the plenary, please accept the invitation to join your breakout. You should be seeing a little pop-up window and you should click on joining your respective room. With screening. The challenge we have with screening is that we are often engaging with people with no symptoms of TB, particularly on sort of if once we move outside household contacts. So they may not have any symptoms and may have minimum awareness of TB and the screening program. So how can we sort of ensure that we engage them in the screening cascade and keep them the whole way through such that we can maximize the impact of of the new screening guidelines and ensure that we are identifying case uh, people with TB uh, at an earlier stage or before they've become unwell enough to think to present to healthcare. So opportunity for any of our uh, anyone who's attending the workshop particularly from programs who have tried to implement screening um, and how they've tried to overcome this 
Otherwise, if I don't see any hands, I will open it up to our panelists to see if they've got any ideas of kind of how, how, how to address this challenge of asymptomatic uh, people being involved in the screening. Um, maybe uh, Thunan Nigan, sorry, I think I may have said your name, but the experience in from the Vietnam. Oh, I see Dr. Sandy's got his hand up. I think if we can unmute you or you can unmute yourself, it would be great to hear. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for that question, Grania. What we have learned is that uh, just by highlighting that you are offering a free chest X-ray, sometimes it can also be a very good selling point for people because uh, people in general, they feel that an X-ray is helpful and uh, uh, it being free entices a lot of people to come. Sometimes you are not even able to meet the, the demand because of the huge numbers that uh, that will come for the screening. Uh, that's what we have seen in the field uh, as we are doing our community-based uh, active case finding. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sandy. That's great. Um, and uh, Min Nguyen, sorry, my Vietnamese is really not very good, so I do apologize. but. Uh, if you please on me, you, you and give your reflections as well. Thank you. Right. Hi. Yes. Uh, thank you for picking me. So I think one of the experience that I've learned uh, during our implementation of active case finding, especially among household contacts, and most of whom are you know asymptomatic, is that we make it more accessible to them because you know, like the operating hours of district health center, which is the health facility of our district in terms of the governmental system of uh, health facilities are usually in the working hours of household contacts, you know, the usual nine to five. And usually that means that people don't want to miss, miss their work or their work or, or their schooling. They will have to either go to private providers or they will just opt not to go to uh, x-ray service at, at, at all. So one of our lesson, one, one of our lessons and also one of our experience in trying to engage with asymptomatic household contacts is to make it accessible to them by uh, utilizing the uh, portable x-ray system along with uh, working with local stakeholders in order to make it more accessible, creating, uh, I'm sorry, establishing uh, x-ray sessions during weekend where people can attend without having to worry about missing either school or work. Great, thank you. These are all great ideas. And I see we have uh, Seraphine Kamisa um, from Zambia. If you can unmute and share, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Uh, some experience from Malawi that we had was really working with the local stakeholders where we had uh, notices even in uh, churches with uh, religious leaders and key uh, leaders in communities were highly involved in advocacy and a lot of um, community awareness way before the active case finding activities were done uh, with use of digital x-ray and CAD as well uh, within uh, high density populations and uh, urban uh, settings where there's uh, uh, high levels of uh, both TB and HIV. Another uh, experience with the prison setting was that we worked again with the leadership, not just in the Minister of Health, but the Minister of Local Government. And, you know, because the, the prison setting is a different setting altogether and they have jurisdiction and you have to have that um, um, etiquette as well that's very important and acceptance of bringing in a tool that is not used uh, all the time in a prison setting so we're able to actually use digital x-ray and cut uh, in, in mass screening in prisons with um, um, the prison populations and there was, there was very good yield uh, even with asymptomatic individuals. Thank you. 
Thank you. And um, I'm going to give uh, uh, Abu Akka Dalhuta, and then I'm going to change themes. So if you'd like to unmute, um, that'd be great. Uh, thank you very much for this topic. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, one additional experience uh, we have is that uh, you are right that it's difficult for somebody who is asymptomatic to understand why he should screen. But uh, looking at uh, the case, uh, he's stimulated to talk to his contacts. Or if there is no contacts, you now tell him the benefits he's going to drive. Because um, in as much as he understands the benefits, which uh, some of us have highlighted that uh, free uh, tests and uh, now, what is the ultimate thing if he is tested and found to have uh, to, to be a case that is going to be cured and uh, will be well enough and he will not infect anybody? So this kind of benefit should be clear to the uh, person. Um, that's one additional thing I think we need to mention. Thank Great, you. thank you. And I think it's clear that communication, both for those who we are screening or involving in active case finding, as well as the kind of agencies that are with the communities around them, uh, it seems to be a theme from those who have experienced it. So thank you. Um, I'm, I'm moving through the topics quite quickly, but I do think it's important we try and touch on as many as we can um, while I, I'm greedy and use your time. Another kind of key theme that has been coming out through the questions and comments is really that this, you, you know, I think we've been aware in the last year to 18 months or longer that the kind of um, workload uh, on healthcare systems and healthcare providers is substantial. Um, and so how, how do we, the, the, the challenges around how do we integrate a kind of active case finding screening programs into a system that uh, may you know is maybe working at full capacity both with 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 what healthcare workers can do with what the lab yeah, infrastructures can do um, with regards to um um kind of resources both human and financial kind of so how how can we start to be putting what could be perceived as extra work into a system that is um, that is pretty stressed or overworked. So, how can we? Um, any thoughts from either anyone on the in our bigger, wider group on 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 how we can put active case finding and screening uh, in in a way that does not further overburden or impact some of the work that's been done, sort of for. Uh, people with TB um, or from our panelists. So I will open the floor with regards to workloads and um, further sort of integrating new things into a program that may be uh, not have the full capacity. So I'll have a little pause while people think on that question. Please raise your hand and we will come to you if you've got any experiences or if this is a challenge that you haven't been able to overcome and we'll see if we can help you. Okay, Dr. Nguyen. Well, yeah, perhaps I could share some of my opinion from Vietnam. We have just gone through a very big wave of COVID-19 outbreak and we are moving toward the bigger wave in the country. And what I have seen so far is there is there are opportunities to integrate COVID and TB uh, together to maximize the human resources as well as uh, other resources. Uh, for example, there is a mass vaccination campaign in Vietnam. You know, the acceptance for COVID vaccine is very high and the speed of vaccination is very high. And people are worried about their comorbidity if they got the COVID, they may become severe uh, condition. Therefore, screening uh, 
among those who come from vaccination campaigns, as I show the picture on my presentation, is feasible. The second option is to screen people who came for COVID testing, COVID screening by mobile chat X-ray. It has been done in some um, hospitals in uh, one of the big cities, and it's shown a, a great. Uh, I mean, you have one doctor, one chat X-ray. <laughs> You do it for both TB and COVID. And the third opportunity is to have the expert machine to test for both COVID and TB. Of course, at this moment, there is two different cartridges for diagnosis of TB and diagnosis of COVID. But I don't know in the future if we find some way to integrate it, like take one sample and to do two tests or even do one test, but for diagnosis of two diseases at the same time it may offer opportunity um, for integration. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that's a very good point. And from um, just from my relatively new role in the Global Fund, I think there has been a many countries who are thinking about bi-directional screening for TB and COVID and the role that things like digital chest X-ray and CAD can play. So there is, there is an opportunity there. Um, Dr. Brendan Mungai, please unmute. We'd love to hear you. All right. Thank you. And uh, I guess you you asked whether or not we've been able to solve. So I would say what I think would be the, you know, one of the ways to solve. And it might not be that we have managed to, to do that um, in, in really our setting all that well. But I think we are we need to think about one integration, as uh, Ben has said. Um, the other one is, and this will always be a challenge, when you introduce something new, you also introduce new tools, you overburden, especially if you're going to use manual tools. In my view, if you were to get an electronic way to capture data from the word go in a simpler way, so that in one, um, in a simpler way, but also that it will be longitudinal data, so that anytime a client comes back and somehow they fall into the screening again, it will solve the issue of, you know, uh, at how many times have you screened to get this positive or, or this? So I think in a way, one of the ways we should try and get the healthcare workers from being data clerks, but to actually do the, the real screening. So I think in terms of documentation, but I think uh, really the adoption of new tools um, may make it easier. So. Like when you think about the, the new portable chest X-ray, so I'm, I'm always thinking that even as we want chest X-ray to be used as a screening tool, integrating it into the mainstream system may always be a challenge, especially because that chest X-ray at a facility will always be doing many other things. You know, they'll be looking at fractures, they'll be looking. So if you're, if you're going to wait for those to to do the screening for you, it will always be a challenge. So this is unfortunate, but I think even as we strengthen the health system, in terms of screening, we might first need to almost like do a, a, an RRI on the side, even in a facility base, to, to try and get as many screens as possible. Of course, get the chest X-ray, get CAD. CAD will help in a big way because of the high throughput. Um, and that way, you, you're able to now deal with those that need, you know, for example, um, sputum testing and this. So I think fast adoption, especially in high volume areas or in, in community screening, for the ones who do community screening or, you know, um, using the new tools will, would really help lessen sort of the workload, even as you, as you add the patients into the system. So I, I think, um, yeah, that's... That's my quick one. And of course, task shifting. I think that has always had a challenge, but I think what can, um, you know, maybe community health workers help in that process so that you're also not taking the few uh, staff, the nurses and clinical officers to, to do something that can be done by somebody else and then they get back into the, into the system. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes. And I think those are all very valid points. And I think it's great that we are getting some of our diagnostic tools to be multi multi disease based that, you know, strengthens the health system as well as the TB program. But it does come with challenges that making sure that 
the TB program has has the access it needs to the tools, both chest X-ray, diagnostic lab infrastructure that it needs both for treating, but more importantly, I think, given the impact of the last year to 18 months, kind of this real drive we have to we have to have on finding those who we've missed in the last period and catching up uh, and then excelling to reach the ambitious targets we had to NTB. Um, I had quite a few more questions, but I feel I've been very greedy with your time already. Um, and I want to thank everyone for all your engagement, um, uh, both with the presenters asking questions and for all the uh, thoughts that you shared on the Slido. Um, and I hope I could have would have loved to have had a further hour in this Q and A, but um, I hope it's been an interesting session. And I, I'll, uh, I want to thank everyone. Um, but I'll hand over to Guy now for the formal closing of the workshop. But uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Grania. Um, so I'm not going to take much more of your time. I want to thank uh, all of the participants for what I think is for their active participation in today and for joining us what has been i think an outstanding session and the the high uh, subs rate of subscription and attendance at this um seminar i i, I think really emphasizes the the importance that people uh, all around the world are, are, are placing on this topic uh, which I think is going to be an increasingly important part of our uh, uh, attempt to end uh, tuberculosis. I want to thank all of those uh, who've been involved in putting this together, uh, Grania and Chikaya for chairing it. Um, in, and in addition, uh, Cecily, Saskia, um, uh, Tuang and um, Vanessa and um, um, he's already left, I think. Um, uh, Jacob, yeah. Jacob, yes. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> uh, for 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 their presentations. I want to particularly thank Saskia for for putting this all pulling this all together. She's done a fantastic job at at uh, at bringing it all together. And I want to thank uh, Carolyn and. Um, and the, the whole team, Marianne, and the team from the union for the behind the scenes work of making this uh, a successful uh, event. Uh, and I, I'm hoping that this might not be, this will sort of foreshadow future events in collaboration between WHO and the union uh, of, of this sort, because I think it was a really quite a successful uh, teamwork team effort between members of both those teams. I should have also thanked Audrey and Agnes, who are also major players from the union side behind the scenes. So thank you to everybody uh, for their participation. And uh, it's now about quarter past two here in Sydney. So I think it's time to finish. <laughs> so uh, thank you, everybody. And um, good night. Oh. Thanks, Thank everyone. Everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. We enjoyed it. Bye.